Tonight, should we blame North Korea for the Sony Pictures hacking? Obama approves millions for police body cameras. And is Uber's user data ripe for hacking? Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 225 for Monday, December 1st, 2014. Happy December. This episode is brought to you by iFixit. You can fix it, and iFixit makes it easy with free step-by-step -step repair guides, high-quality replacement parts, and all the tools you'll need. For $10 off your purchase of $50 or more, go to the iFixit.com slash twit website and enter the code TN2 at checkout. Hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into the tech feed. Reuters is reporting that Sony Pictures Entertainment has hired FireEye's Man Mandiant forensics unit to investigate a huge cyber attack that knocked out the studio's computer network almost a week ago, according to three people with knowledge of the matter. The FBI is reportedly also investigating this incident. Now, Sony's computers went offline last Monday after displaying a red skull in the phrase hacked by hashtag GOP, which reportedly does not stand for what you think it stands for. It stands for Guardians of Peace. That's according to the Los Angeles Times. Mandian is an incident response firm that helps victims of breaches identify how big attacks actually are and help clean up the networks and help restore systems. The firm has handled some of the largest breaches breaches rather uncovered today including the 2013 attack on target which was last holiday season about a year ago now the wall street journal notes that this attack on sony appears to have used similar tools to those used last year to attack south korean television stations and atms this is according to people briefed on the situation See how I get creative with those? South Korea publicly blamed those at the time, 2013 attacks, on North Korea. This has led to some investigators to perhaps believe that North Korea played a role in the breach at Sony's film and television studio, which is one of the largest in the U.S. You might say, well, why would they attack Sony? Well, the studio is about to release a movie called The Interview, which is a comedy where U.S. spies enlist a television host to assassinate North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. In June, a spokesman for Pyongyang government said that distribution of the movie would be, quote, the most undisguised terrorism and war action and threatened a, quote, strong and merciless countermeasure if the U.S. government patronizes the film. However, someone at Sony Pictures with knowledge of the matter told the journal that a connection to North Korea is just one of many possibilities that the studio is examining and it has no direct knowledge that that nation was involved in the attack at all. Moving on now to some other news. In an executive order, the White House has announced that it's pledging $263 million in funding for police training and body cameras. $75 million of that will go towards buying 50,000 cameras for law enforcement officers across the country. Sounds like a lot. But currently, there are over 750,000 police officers in the U.S. It is a start, though. The remainder of the money will go towards training police in the responsible use of paramilitary equipment, which many local governments acquired from Homeland Security programs. Plus, funds will provide police outreach programs with the hope of building trust between local departments and their communities. Many believe that the cameras provide a record of police activities, and there have been calls Quite a few of them for more body cameras in the wake of recent events in Ferguson, Missouri and ensuing nationwide protests. All right. I actually have kind of a little treat today because I am joined in person by another other than Jason Snell of sixcolors.com. Hello, Jason. It's good to be here. It's you're looking very in fall. The flesh. I yeah. got yeah, I got the <laughs> orange going on. Yes, you're looking very flesh. No, you're looking very burnt orange, very pumpkin. Thank you. How was your Thanksgiving? Uh it was great. We had a great time. Um a lot of we hosted, so a lot Ooh. of yeah, a lot of cooking, a lot of uh, we had to rent like a table because there were too many people and everybody and no leftovers because everybody ate everything, which I guess is successful. It's good, but gosh, you really want the turkey sandwich the next day. You I know? know, I know. There was a little bit left. I think I had one turkey sandwich worth, but most of the other stuff was gone. Well, it sounds like a success. Well, thank you for being here with us today. You're actually going to do one of our other shows after this show ends for anybody who can stick around after this particular episode. But let's let's talk about Uber. Uh, we we uh, we just can't stop talking about Uber here on TN2. It's much everybody's as, favorite topic, isn't it? Yeah, because it's you know you sort of love to hate them because they seem like a bully, and there are executives that you know have done some somewhat questionable things, and they're kind of 
turn, has turned into a lot of questions of what is really going on behind the scenes there? What are they doing with their data? Are they being responsible? Because this is obviously a company that has scaled very quickly. So there is a, a recent article that Uber has taken disciplinary action against one of its top uh, managers who's based in New York over privacy violations. Now, this is Josh Moore, who's the head of New York City operations for Uber, who apparently had shown that he could track a particular journalist at one point, which is not the same incident as the infamous dinner party, Sarah Lacey possible tracking, right. but still would use the same kind of technology that Uber probably has. Suggests so uh, a similar attitude here, right? Which is we can we can look you up. We have your right. data in our database. And I would I don't think anyone in, anyone's disputing that Uber has that power that obviously would be the way that a company would work if you've got uh, credit card information and people attached to certain rides and probably even for safety purposes if i needed to be tracked somewhere let's say i you know was making a complaint or something you would probably be able to tell if i as an active uber user was actively in a ride but of course you can use that for nefarious reasons as well right i mean the the first story about people at uber being able to uh, look at this stuff up you look at that and you're like, well, maybe this is an isolated incident. Maybe this is part of a trend. The Washington Post did a story today that actually I thought was a really interesting angle on this, which is if Uber is collecting all that data, who else could use it? Who could mm. hack into Uber's systems and use that for other purposes? Because you've got potentially people in government, uh, you know, public figures who could be uh, analyzed and their personal habits could be tracked by you know, our own intelligence services, foreign intelligence services, mm -hmm. uh, and anybody else who could hack into Uber's system, which I think is a really interesting uh, thought about this, that this isn't just about will Uber employees be able to get access to the data. And the Post story says, yes, there were job, job applicants, people doing job interviews who had access to the entire Uber database, which is scary. Very. But there's that other level, which is who else could hack into that database? You mentioned the target privacy breach earlier. Well, what's the what's the data policy at Uber, not just for their staff, but how long do they keep this data? How do they aggregate it? Do they anonymize it in any way? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you uh, obviously the, you know, target the company was... Certainly didn't want that to happen, but you might not think of a large retail chain that's been around forever as as having you know the the most technical know-how behind the scenes. A company like Uber, you would. The company is not old. It's obviously mobile first. Uh, it's extremely data and analytics driven. But yeah, but at the same time, how do you figure out? Okay, well, this person has clearance to look at some of this data and should only be used for this reason, and here's how we will be able to tell if this person ever does wrong, which of course kind of comes back to the case of investigating one of their executives that apparently had the, have, had the power to look up people and demonstrated how it would happen. Do you think the whole disciplinary action is just for face, for show? Well, they need to do something. Yeah. Right? And I think they want to show that they're more than just punishing him, they want to show that they have policies in place. I'm actually less concerned about their policies than I am about the way this is set up because it sounds to me like it's very easy. It's almost like you're on the honor system at Uber, that they have policies and the policy is don't do that. Right. But are there safeguards in place? Are are Can anybody really look it up at any time and you're just crossing your fingers and hoping they don't? Or is this more locked down? Are they, are they making strides to make this data very hard for anybody at Uber to get? And, you know, that's the other part of this message. Sending the message that it's not okay in their culture is great. And, that, and that's why they had to do this, uh, you know, censuring this, this executive. But what's the other step? How, how physically is this stuff being protected? Whether it's from hackers or people on the outside or just from regular people who work at, at Uber, it, that part is unclear. So, okay, let's say that there is some sort of a breach of Uber's database, something that would give a hacker or someone outside the company a lot of information. I happen to use Uber quite a bit because I live in an urban area and, you know, parking sucks. So it's actually, you know, it's been an app that I've used quite a bit. So you would probably get a somewhat good idea of the places I might frequent right. and then return to. For someone who's using the app casually here and there, what kind of data would would hackers be able to get? I think the question, I mean, obviously the more you use it, the more it's going to be uh, an issue because there are more mm. data points. And you could, if, if you were trying to get some dirt on somebody who's involved in politics or works in government mm. and you found out that they had a certain schedule and you linked that to other other personal data that you had and found out that they were having an affair or 
for security reasons, it's somebody who's got some security issues and you find their schedule and you know where you can find them at any given time. That could be an issue too. There are a bunch of different ways that we may not think of taking a car. We, we may think of it like a cab ride, which is essentially anonymous, and especially if you pay in cash. And with Uber, the data is, uh, the more you use Uber, the more it tells a story of your, of your life in a way that, uh, right down to the address, if you put in the real address. In fact, one of the uh, people quoted in the Washington Post story suggests, start saying you're going to a place down the block across the street from where you're actually going right. so that Uber doesn't know exactly where you ended up. Well, you know, I've gotten advice because there have been incidents of Uber drivers assaulting riders. Never happened to me. I've been yelled at a couple times for my bad attitude. Or I don't know, whatever. They're, wow. pro they're probably having a bad day as well. But I have been... I've been told, oh, you know what you do? You just have them pick you up a couple blocks away from your house so that they don't actually know where you live. And I thought, well, this is a problem. You know, if, I, if, you know, yeah. if I'm as worried about you know, the, my valet as I am about, you know, some creep that's hanging behind a trash can on my street, that's, that's an issue. That, you know, there's got to be a better solution than that. Yeah. So hey, this is, I think in some ways you could say this is all growing pains. Uh, Uber is a, it's a company that came to us with a really good idea, which is what if we can make uh, the idea of getting a, a car much easier by using smartphone technology? That's great. Yeah. Now we're getting into all of these questions, which I think some of them they may have thought of, some of them may not have thought of, some of them they may have said, might have said, we'll deal with this in a year or two. And now they're saying, oh, geez, we need to deal with this now. This has become a bigger problem than we realized. But I think in, in some ways this was all inevitable because um, this is this is the world we live in. You start to think, they know where I live. Is that important? Right. Do I really want to share that with them or do I just want to ride to my destination and, you know, and do that in peace? Do you think the disciplinary action against this one executive is enough. I know there were certain people calling for Travis Kalanick, who's the CEO's resignation. Do, is it, so, it? Do you think the company's like, this isn't going to blow over or should they have done more? I think, I mean, you look at the value probably on the inside to who these people are and say, can we afford to lose this person or to sacrifice them? And I think that Uber is definitely a very aggressive company and they're sort of saying, look, we're not going to we're not going to fire people just for show here, but we are going to try and make it clear that this is not okay. And that may work. I, I, I think this is not a, as big a deal outside of tech circles as it is inside. But what I said on Twitter yesterday actually is that the more people who are tech savvy get feel funny about Uber, the less they're likely to recommend it. Mm -hmm. the stories about Uber that tech journalists write are going to be a little more skeptical because of things like this. So I think it's important for them to send a message at least a little bit, that their corporate culture is going to change in terms of personal data. And whether that's saying, look, we, we, we punished this guy and he's not going to do it again and everybody else knows they need to not do this again either, maybe that's enough. I think it's, I think it's a good sign that they're doing it. And, you know, would firing him have made that much of a difference in changing their culture? It probably would have just been another gesture. Jason Snell, thank you so much for being here it's in pleasure. person. I Absolutely. don't think I don't think this has happened for a few months. It's exciting. It is fun. High five. Yeah. Woo. Woo. Touched you in real All life. Right. Wow, that doesn't happen very often on this show. <laughs> Jason Snell, of course, writes for sixcolors.com, S I X C O L O R S dot com. And uh, you'll be on an upcoming show as well. Excellent. Sitting next to me again. Maybe even wearing the same outfit. Possibly. Yeah, you know, you never know. We'll see. Coming up, how big was online shopping on traditional retail shopping? Behemoth Black Friday this year. Pretty big. And for those tracking Santa, Google Santa tracker site is back. But first, this holiday season, you want to give a good gift that somebody actually wants and will use, right? What about the gift of DIY repair with iFixit's Pro Tech Toolkit and Magnetic Project Mat Bundle, huh? With this special holiday deal, you or any DIYer that you know and love on your list can tackle pretty much any electronics repair. You can see there... Oh, that's actually, those are my hands from a different day. Nice nail polish, Sarah. Hmm. The ProTech Toolkit has 70 tools to assist you with any mod or malfunction or misfortune because you know that those t tend to come our way, especially when you use your gadgets quite a bit. It includes iFixit's 54-bit driver kit with a standard, a specialty, and security bits, and a lot more. If you drop a tiny screw or you forget how to put your device back together, maybe you took it apart and then you're like, oh man, I'm kind of stuck. iFixit has a solution, the magnetic project mat, which will hold and organize all those little parts. 
and the dry erase surface lets you take notes on what you've done, what you're doing next, so you can reassemble things quickly and error-free. iFixit has something for every DIYer, hacker, and geek on your holiday list this year. Head over to ifixit.com slash twit, where they've extended their Black Friday deal on the ProTech Toolkit and Magnetic Project Matte Bundle for only $59.95. But you have to purchase it before Tuesday at midnight Pacific time. So you've got time, but, but act now. Enter the code TN2, that's TN and then the number two, at checkout, and you'll save $10 off that or any purchase of $50 or more. That's ifixit.com slash twit. And enter that code TN2 at checkout for $10 off. On to a few more stories that we are following today. So here in the U.S. and now in some parts of Europe, too, Black Friday is a pretty big deal. It's the start of the holiday sales rush. And so far, there are record numbers for e-commerce retail with holiday shopping across the U.S. and Europe approaching $130 billion. This is according to figures from Forrester Research. Now, on the flip side, retail shopping at physical stores is down 11% to $50.9 billion from $57.4 billion just a year ago. So, interesting little trend, right? Based on early numbers from Comscore, online sales got off to a good start in the U.S., with Thanksgiving topping $1 billion and Black Friday passing $1.5 billion, which is growth of 32% and 26% over 2013, respectively. Forestville Research, Forrester Research rather, is predicting a record year for online shopping with the U.S., reaching an all-time high of $89 billion, which is up 13% from 2013. This would account for 30% of all e-commerce spend in the entire year of 2014. So very, very crucial month for retailers. Now, as if dressing room mirrors weren't bad enough, Nordstrom has decided to test out full length dressing room mirrors in Seattle, Washington and San Jose, California that also double as websites that are powered by eBay. So maybe you'd want to read a product review on something before you buy it, or maybe you see something in a different color or maybe you need a different size and you don't want to get dressed again and leave the dressing room or call out to the person who's not really that responsive anyway, this could be really, really handy. Nordstrom plans between this year and 2018 to have spent $1.2 billion on tech like e-commerce such as this, fulfillment centers, and in-store service enhancements like these connected fitting rooms. Upscale department chain Bloomingdale's also recently began trying out smart fitting rooms that were equipped with wall-mounted iPads rather than Nordstrom's interactive mirrors at five of its stores. I just wish bathing suit shopping was more fun. Finally, for anybody who likes knowing the whereabouts of Santa Claus, and I know some of you do, Google's relaunched its Santa Tracker website, along with updates for its accompanying Android app and Chrome extension. So throughout the month of December, which obviously started today, Google is promising Santa's elves will unlock a new project or game each day until Christmas Eve when Santa makes, you know, his journey around the world, as he does. Now, as in previous years, the games will let you train and race reindeer and pack presents. But this year, Google's also promising candy cane cartography, holiday tradition tests, and even jolly JavaScript courses. I am not kidding about that last part. That's really what they're promising. But that's not all. On December 24th, Microsoft is promising users will be able to track Santa on its interactive 3D globe. And every stop along the way you can click specially curated Bing results page that will feature fun facts and beautiful imagery for each location in Microsoft's words anyway and that is it for this edition of tech news tonight it's really beginning to feel a lot like Christmas isn't it subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash tn2 you can write us at tn2 at twit.tv and watch live every weekday at 4 p.m pacific 7 p.m eastern time and of course don't miss our morning news program tech news today tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m pacific 1 p.m eastern hope you can join us for both I'm Sarah Lane, and thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.